The return is very large for the size of the investment. One only has to think, for example, that during the Cold War, diplomacy played a huge role in maintaining stability between the United States and the Soviet Union. If it had failed, the chances of a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union would have been much larger, and the Cuban Missile Crisis is perhaps the immediate demonstrator or the immediate factual backup for that statement. So we, in fact, have begun to lose sight in this country of the value of diplomacy during that long, dark period in which we relied heavily on diplomacy rather than the use of military force, which in itself, uh, just to add on, hasn't proved to be very effective at solving diplomatic problems. Well, if you go back, as I have been doing, and begin uh, again to read some of the histories of the revolution, many of which are now being written again, uh, you find how significant it was that our mission to France uh, before the French Revolution played a huge role in our victory at Yorktown <laughs> and, in effect, uh, in the supply situation, which kept uh, a really impoverished Continental Army going uh, during the period which we fought with the British. So it was quite remarkable that, in fact, diplomacy played a salient role. Diplomacy played a salient role during the Civil War. I don't want to only focus on conflicts in keeping the British out. And that was very, very important because the British inclination was to go with the South because of its dependence on the South for raw cotton to feed its textile industries. So we can find those examples across the board. And in many ways, their in intimate discussion of or perhaps intimate relation of the major role diplomacy plays in our national security, uh, which people tend to forget because it is not a large budget item and it is often disdained because its accomplishments are often in avoiding conflict rather than participating in conflict. Well, five decades is a little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> a little bit at the, be at the end of the first decade and a little bit at the beginning of the last decade. But I, I did spend over 40 years, and 45 including my time in military service, and security was a very important question. And unfortunately, because of the growth of terrorist organizations and others who wanted to use violence against Americans, particularly unarmed Americans, uh, for the diplomatic service, it is an, a, a, and continues to be a very significant effort. Secretary Clinton asked me to be chairman of the Accountability Review Board to look at Benghazi. And it's exam an example of how Americans representing our country in small places, in violent areas overseas, who play an essential role in <clears throat> building our understanding of what's going on, but even more important, <clears throat> relating to uh, foreigners, to non-Americans, uh, what the U.S. hopes to achieve and building a working relationship with them, what they undergo when they find themselves in the midst of what can only be called a seething mass of terrorist violence. Uh, and our ability to protect them is limited. Uh, we found in Benghazi that we could have been smarter about how we did that and maybe more focused on how we did that. But nevertheless, it is hard. And so we're asking young Americans unarmed, uh, often in very dangerous places, to do very important jobs for us in a way that is in many fashions unsung until they get killed or wounded. I was Under Secretary of State when that took place. I had been in Dar es Salaam for <clears throat> two years uh, back in the uh, late 60s when there was not the danger. Uh, the bombing took place in a building which I knew well because at the time I was there, it was the Embassy of Israel. <laughs> Israel had to abandon its relationship in Dar es Salaam as a world result of the 1967 and the 1972-73 wars. Uh, that we were able to buy that building. It was a good building. It had rather good setback. And the better news from Dar es Salaam as opposed to Nairobi was that it was in a relatively residential area of Dar es Salaam and the guard did not allow the truck carrying the bomb in through the gate for which he gave his life. Uh, and the 
the damage was still horrendous because the bomb was so huge, uh, but the setback helped and in many ways justified the notion that we continue to need setbacks in our embassy, 100 feet away from the perimeter wall to protect our people against bombing attacks. Uh, so it was a situation in which we were partially prepared but not well prepared. Prudence Bushnell, who was our ambassador in Nairobi, knew and understood this and wrote messages before the attack on Nairobi. I cannot recall that I ever knew about those messages, and I'm distraught because I had, as much as anybody else did, responsibility for assuring that our embassies were secure, even though it wasn't in my principal bailiwick. My job as undersecretary meant uh, that perhaps as the then highest ranking foreign service officer, uh, I was as much as anybody else responsible for looking after the service as a whole. It was a kind of traditional job for the highest ranking foreign service officer. And I'm certainly uh, in uh, every sense of the word uh, acutely aware of the fact, beginning in my days in El Salvador and in the Middle East, how important uh, security is in the role of the American ambassador overseas. In El Salvador, I really never let a country team meeting, which I had every day, uh, go by without a review of the security situation in that difficult country, because we were also there under attack. Well, I think I did. <laughs> the intelligence information, which was pretty good, indicated that the Salvadoran extreme right wing, as a result of very strenuous steps we had taken uh, for, in many ways, under the leadership of Vice President George H.W. Bush, who came to do this particular job, to end death squad activities. Uh, and he, uh, as a result of both our suggestion and his own really magnificent leadership uh, got the Salvadoran military uh, to take a very active role in helping us stop death squad violence. I suspect that if I was the target of the hard right in El Salvador, who were clearly promoting death squad activities, it was in some measure as a result of those kinds of actions that we had taken. We were also very committed in those days, uh, as we should have been, uh, to stopping all violence against civilians and to doing what we can uh, to undo uh, some of the violent actions of some of the military groups, uh, which were, put it this way, uh, less than patient in following the Geneva Convention rules. It's difficult because so much of this involves so many other people that as leader of a team, you have to be acutely conscious that they share in many ways in what happened. But I think the team that I had in New York, uh, that uh, I worked closely with at the time of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and our ability, uh, I believe because of the circumstances of the time, because of the support of President Bush and Secretary Baker, because of their conviction that the United Nations Security Council had uh, an important role to play uh, made, in fact, our efforts from the beginning of August 1990 uh, until the period of the end of war termination in April and May 1991 very, very important. And I was pleased and proud uh, that the Security Council and our role in it was very much, as one uh, might have said, the founders envisaged it as they put the charter together under Franklin Roosevelt in 1944 and Harry Truman in 1945. The uh, greatest challenge of the Foreign Service, I think, is to find a way uh, to uh, do everything possible to be as professional as they can be, to be as well prepared, to be as well educated, to be as deeply experienced as they can be, and to convince those who now seemingly want to substitute, and the tendency has been great uh, even in the 19th century, political appointments for professional appointments, that we are a professional service, uh, that as a result of that, that dedication, that knowledge is extremely important. And I think increasingly these days, particularly in the convoluted and difficult problems of the Middle East. It is an intimate knowledge of the region, its cultures, its language, and indeed its history, 
that makes a difference in how we advise the president and the secretary with respect to the foreign policy choices. And we have a number of people, uh, Deputy Secretary Burns, who's an old friend and a person whom I greatly admire, is a great example of how a very serious, experienced professional foreign service officer can, should be, and is uh, playing a role uh, in advising uh, about the foreign policy choice that are most important. I cannot think of a more important role for a foreign service officer than to be a major contributor to the foreign policy process. I thought as an ambassador and as undersecretary, uh, that was the highest calling, uh, the highest challenge, and indeed the highest opportunity, put it this way, for satisfaction if we did it right, uh, to combine the professional knowledge, history, background, and experience uh, with the service over the years and for the possibility of speaking to the decision makers about that in a context which would give them help in understanding uh, what were the best of sometimes very difficult foreign policy choices. Well, I think we first professionalized the service because we knew that in the 1870s and the 1880s, uh, we had begun to try to professionalize the civil service of the United States to no longer make it um, essentially a spoil system for uh, political victors. And the notion indeed that professionalization, which then followed in the American army after the deleterious experience of the Civil War, when we professionalized the American army in, 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 the, in the 1890s, and then the Navy, all set the pattern. And we said a diplomatic service needs to be professional. It has to have experience. It can't be that money, privilege, and political influence are the only bases uh, for deciding uh, who, in fact, should be useful and indeed important in making American foreign policy decisions. And so competition, merit, uh, the question of either serving well or getting out of the way, <laughs> which are part of our system, uh, the fact that you can go anywhere, anytime, that you're obligated to do that, are all important attributes of an arrangement in which it makes the diplomatic service, or the foreign service as I prefer to call it, a great deal more like the military service in the way in which it is organized and in the way in which people serve. Well, I think that like others, uh, I came to the foreign service after the long telegram, but lived in awe. Uh, in fact, of George Kennan's ability uh, to write and encapsulate, even in a very long document, so much of what I've been talking to you about today, professionalism, deep experience, knowledge and understanding of the country, proficiency in the language, uh, a clear notion of who the key players are and what motivates them. And that was in many ways the continued perhaps best known example of how a professional American Foreign Service officer who made his career around understanding and knowing Russia, but particularly the Soviet Union piece of Russia, uh, could provide the kind of advice which would set the course for the United States in a policy of dealing with then a growing antagonism with the Soviet Union following the Second World War and how and in what way to use it. I had the opportunity on a number of occasions to meet uh, George Kennan, always found him absolutely fascinating. Uh, uh, obviously a man with great breadth, but even more, very enjoyable to read. He, he, he wrote beautifully and he had this marvelous capacity to put forward ideas in a short compass, but in a very clear way and a sense, a sense of expression that in fact served his own, put it this way, professional knowledge and accomplishments as a, as a kind of team effort inside his own body, if I can put it that way, that, and in his mind that made a serious difference in this. Um, and in, on a number of those occasions, uh, we had opportunities to discuss the Foreign Service and the future of the Foreign Service. He was a great traditionalist about the Foreign Service. I'm not sure I agree with him uh, on that. Uh, but he felt, in fact, that the Foreign Service had a huge role to play, and even in his days. And this was uh, back in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s, uh, when he was still growing old but very sharp, uh, that in many ways the 
political system in the United States was not using the Foreign Service the way it ought to be, and that the Foreign Service in some ways, in his view, had failed to take advantage of the opportunities they had been given or perhaps failed to push hard on the door that was closing on them from his perspective. And I share some of that today, and I've talked about that. Yes, many things. Um, when I was ambassador in Russia, and Russia had just moved from communism to something different, we're not sure yet what that fully was, but a much more open system, I reckon that I spent about 25% of my time across the months uh, on working with American business. Uh, one of the things that we did very quickly was to find out that in the post-Soviet system, where there were on one day's rules against all private ac economic activity and the next day no rules at all, uh, many Russians were smart enough, capable enough, and maybe put it this way, uh, untrammeled enough to take advantage of American investors uh, so that after a year of so-called partnership, they ended on up on top and the Americans ended up on the airplane out of the country having lost their investment. And this was heavily a question of small and medium-sized investors who became victims, obviously, to a failure to understand who their Russian partners were, a failure to understand how the Russian government at three levels uh, could work for or against them, a failure to understand that our embassy and our consulates in Russia were there to help them out, and a failure to understand a great deal about how and in what way uh, that rough and tumble Wild West business atmosphere was going to be very difficult for them to control. Um, and while in many ways it was the large companies with serious assets and a long time interest in moving into Russia, uh, and able to work in areas where they had, uh, put it this way, a significant role in the market uh, so that an individual Russian entrepreneur partner of an American couldn't take over the, the business and make the same kind of headway uh, that the American could. Those were all very interesting and distinguishing characteristics. And within a year of my service in Moscow, we had put together rules for doing business in Russia, things to watch out for and things to watch out for. Uh, we had taken a, a business club, a kind of organization of informal uh, relationships among American business, and helped to turn that into an American Chamber of Commerce, and worked very hard to support and stimulate a similar organization for doing business in Russia here in Washington. Um, and we had brought over and had operating, even before I got there, uh, individuals from the Foreign Commercial Service, the Department of Commerce, Foreign Service officers, as well as State Department officers in the economic and financial area who could provide this kind of advice and support to American business as we went literally from tiny investment uh, to a ballooning of that kind of activity. And interestingly enough, even in today's hard times, in September of 2014, uh, we can see that American business still has an important role to play in Russia, and up until now, the Russians are respectful of American business, even as we seemingly are headed into a tougher period of sanctions. It's a subject of lots of controversy. Uh, victory has a thousand fathers. My own feeling was that it was primarily economic, uh, that uh, Gorbachev uh, knew about this when he took power in the late uh, 1980s, uh, fought against it, uh, failed to do so. Uh, much of what, um, uh, in the simplest of all possible terms, brought Russia down uh, were several aspects of trying to manage the economy. Uh, one was that they spent more than they took in, even though it was a wealthy country. Another was that they were, in some ways, uh, fascinated by the idea that they had in a whatever way they could militarily to contend with the United States. And I saw an aviation museum uh, of the Russian Air Force outside of Moscow while I was there uh, that had all the planes that uh, we never built, <laughs> but they read about <laughs> and made. Uh, a third was that the communist system was ineffective and inefficient at managing an economy. It ignored markets. It tried to do central planning. 
Uh, it was ineffective in a sense that the Russians, for numerous reasons, including ineffectiveness and inefficiency in moving goods and services, uh, when they constructed a plant, had to construct around it everything that was required to manufacture their project. So if it was military or civil aviation, and often they put these in remote areas, in part for security reasons, in part for job, uh, for job promotion reasons, uh, had not only to manufacture all the spare parts, uh, but uh, also had to create farms, schools, and health services at the expense of the industry in order to try to provide uh, for the workers and their families the sort of existence that it would at least make them reasonably effective in, in producing the aircraft. So they built huge inefficiencies into the system by believing, in fact, that something like Gosplan, the national planning enterprise for the economy, was going to be wiser and smarter than the competition in the economy. And as a result, obviously, they paid an increasingly high price for this. And over a period of time, in the modern Soviet Union, they had both the guns and butter to provide. Uh, butter failed, <laughs> guns built. Uh, but by, let's say, 1988, 1989, it became very clear that they were increasingly uh, failing to provide for their people what their people expected and needed. And this led, I think, to much of the change and much of the popularity. Not that the first revolution in August of 1990, uh, in which, in fact, the old hardliners uh, took power by isolating Gorbachev in the Crimea, and then uh, Mr. Yeltsin, uh, with the support of the tanks of one of the Russian armored divisions around Moscow, uh, changed uh, the trajectory forever. And in the end, uh, very quickly, within a year and a half, communism was out, Yeltsin was in power, uh, but then all the new challenges began of how, in fact, to operate and run both the political system and the economy on a basis that would make things work. And I was there in 1993, in October, uh, when violence, uh, October 3rd, at the Russian White House, which was then the parliament, uh, took over uh, in a confrontation over whether, in effect, uh, the parliament, uh, still very much a creature of an election within the old Soviet Communist Party, or Mr. Yeltsin and his new wave of thinking and his new wave of ideas would, in fact, prevail. And it again was Yeltsin, with the support of the military, uh, that within a space of, say, 36 hours, was able once again to take control. But there, uh, to the chagrin, embarrassment, indeed to the horror of many Russians, people were being killed on the street. Not huge volumes, but enough to certainly worry the Russians, who have, in my view, a continued deep concern about violence in their own country, foreign invasions, civil war, certainly the horrible civil war in the early 1920s, were all things that the Russians felt very, very strongly about. And so that's a, an interesting indication of sort of what that transition was like, how it went, and, and what were the progenitors for that change. But I, I believe, in fact, that it was domestic economic failure as much as anything else, somehow engendered perhaps by more of their own decisions than the decisions outside. But the wisdom of George Kennan uh, to talk about a policy of containment, and he had a somewhat different idea about that, and nevertheless helped uh, in many ways to bring about what he clearly envisaged uh, some 50 years before it happened, uh, that this system wouldn't work, uh, that it would fail on its own, and that it was our job uh, to wait that out uh, without trying to cause a maximum amount of disruption if we could. Vladimir Putin is still a man of the old administration, uh, heavily influenced by his education, and his service in the Committee for State Security. Uh, he was for a number of years in Dresden in Germany and came back and went into the Russian university system, <laughs> a kind of unabashed uh, communist idea that we need commissars in the universities. Uh, came under the influence of Anatoly Sobchak, who later became a liberal mayor of, uh, of St. Petersburg, worked for Anatoly Sobchak, where I first met him, 
and then began climbing up the ladder. But he never lost sight of what I think are still his conclusions, that the Russian public wants stability and security. Again, some of the points I made about the horrors of civil war in Russia, and indeed the horrors of the Second World War in Russia. Secondly, uh, that the Russian public uh, over the years has, uh, has sought um, a strong leader, someone with vlast, with the power uh, to run the state. Uh, thirdly, that he was thrown into the middle of a situation uh, where he had to contend with elections. And that in recent years, uh, despite his comeback, if I could put it that way, his engineered comeback as president after having uh, uh, President Medvedev served an interim period, he was not, uh, I think, uh, uh, some years ago, a man with growing popularity. And the parliamentary elections of a few years ago indicated to him uh, that he had a problem, and that was followed by demonstrations on the streets. And so I think that much of what we're seeing now on the part of Mr. Putin is to take advantage of the penchant among Russians for stability and for strong national feelings uh, to exploit those particular ideas as a way of continuing to maintain himself in power. And we have seen, in fact, measured by the popularity indices in Russia, uh, that he's gone up from the low 60s to a much higher number. Uh, my own view is that he's a man who is uh, tactical, heavily influenced in his tactical judgments by his intelligence experience, doesn't seem to cavil at the use of stealth, uh, the use of what we would call covert operations, or the use, indeed, of outright, uh, uh, let me be clear, misleading statements <laughs> as a way to protect his interests. Uh, he seemingly has grown up in a society, in an atmosphere, in an organization, uh, in a group, the Russian intelligence service, uh, that makes a virtue out of those kinds of things. And so we now face a very difficult problem with Mr. Putin. Strategically, uh, and I'll just make this one last comment, he seems to have ignored the fact that the Russian economy is still much too over-dependent on exports of oil and gas. And he has not taken the income uh, that he has enjoyed uh, from high oil and gas prices uh, to diversify his own economy and to build a stronger base on which Russia could stand. And so this vulnerability, and it is a vulnerability as well as an advantage, uh, is the challenge strategically as to how and in what way uh, we can find uh, a, a future set of arrangements with Russia where Putin's seeming aggressive expansionist attitude has been to be put back in the box. Sectarianism in the Middle East has been a serious factor at times, and it is now perhaps more emergent and more controversial uh, and, and more destructive than we have seen it for some time. Part of this is obviously stimulated by the revolutionary ideas and the return to so-called fundamental principles of Islam from the period of the Prophet Muhammad uh, that uh, the uh, fundamentalism uh, in input to the sectarian divide on both sides has played a very important role. And so uh, Iranian Shia uh, in their revolution of 78 and 79 have adopted a course of action in which theology, uh, it is heavily a theocratic government, plays an important role in their vision. Uh, and now we have the Islamic State uh, of Iraq and, and, and greater Syria, uh, which in itself is what I would call, if not the final evolution, uh, a more advanced evolution of the growth and fundamentalism in Islam. You can trace that back perhaps to the 18th century and, and a man by the name of Abdul Wahhab in Saudi Arabia, uh, but then up through Al-Qaeda and now to, uh, to ISIS or ISIL. Uh, and so that's added what one would call a, a note of uh, antagonism, uh, 
a note of the religious equivalent of xenophobia, <laughs> and a deep sense of militancy uh, that has now become uh, pervasive in the Middle East. Lest, however, we forget, it is also reinforced by ethnic differences. So that Shiism, uh, not uniquely a, a Persian variant, is heavily dominated by the Persians. Uh, Sunnism or Sunni feelings and Sunni views, Sunni tradition, is, is heavily prevalent among Arabs. Uh, and so the Arab-Persian divide has to be factored into the problem. And the next level down, of course, you have a certain element of tribalism and you have the remnants, of, put it this way, or at least the pieces of various political tendencies that one way or another are associated. Uh, Iran is essentially a theocracy, but we have to be careful about making that too simplistic. Uh, the Sunni world has parties inspired by religion, parties inspired by political ideology, uh, parties inspired by uh, Arab nationalism, uh, and so on. And so these are all tendencies that now play into this controversy in thinking. And to think it is simply Sunni, Shia. Never the twain shall meet. Uh, constant, uh, long-term, uh, inter-Islamic uh, war is a mistake. And we saw, for example, in Iraq how important it was uh, for us to establish relations uh, with the Sunni opposition uh, uh, inside Iraq uh, at a critical time when, in fact, uh, the fighting wasn't going well as a way of seeing how through working with them and their tribal structures and their political structures, we could shift things around. To some extent, that challenge still exists in a slightly different form, um, but to some extent too, the violence and indeed the untrammeled nature of the radicalism of ISIS will, if not now, shortly begin to produce, even among the Sunni population in the north, the kind of deep concern and revulsion uh, that we have seen in the past when revolutionary organizations have gone through their worst periods. It's first and foremost not our fight, but we have to deal with the people who are determined to bring violence and danger and, and, and obviously uh, attack us. And so we have, uh, in every sense of the word, uh, to assist and support those who are prepared to help in steps and ideas and thoughts that defend our country. Uh, and that's significant. Uh, and so while we have no particular interest in the fight, we have a particular interest in those who are sympathetic to us and where we go. Secondly, uh, democracy should be promoted and supported in whatever way that we can do so, but we should know and understand that those who will bring democracy, and I believe there are some who can, uh, to an evolving Middle East will do so over a long period of time. Um, they will be people of the region and the area. That democracy cannot be imposed as a foreign idea uh, in the Arab world or in the Muslim world in general. Uh, and that we need to have examples of how and where it can work effectively and meet the needs of the population. Certainly uh, what we used to like to call the Arab Spring had uh, popular participation in part because the public, whether it was in Egypt or Yemen or in Bahrain, uh, were not satisfied with the governance arrangements, the economic circumstances, the social justice, if I could put it that way, of whatever government they were living in and wanted change. Uh, the really interesting question is why in fact did those who were interested in democracy failed to come forward and lead, and why were they, in effect, shut out uh, by either on the one hand military government or on the other hand uh, by religiously based parties and ideas, uh, in part because in the evolution of Arab thought and in the unrolling of these ideas, uh, these latter particular influences were stronger, more prevalent, and more able to come together.
But Egypt is an interesting example because in the early days in Tahrir Square, uh, very rapidly the Muslim Brotherhood moved to join the movement and indeed moved to become a major motivator of the movement and its own long-standing system of providing social benefits to the disadvantaged in Cairo and elsewhere around Egypt were all part of a mobilization effort that meant that they were stronger, more capable than what I would call the Google guys <laughs> who also played an important role in leading the change. And as a result, instead of having a Google guys government, if I could put it that way, uh, we had a, 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 a Muslim Brotherhood government, which utterly failed because of the narrow blinders that it wore about how and in what way Egyptian religious attitudes should play the predominant role, both in domestic policy and in foreign affairs. And President Morsi then failed uh, to meet the test, if I could put it this way, of governance in Egypt, and as and, 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 and unhappy as it is, uh, that failed, uh, and uh, they used uh, uh, violence and takeover, not an election process, uh, to change their situation, something that obviously didn't meet our needs or standards, but with which we have to live. India's not outperforming China economically, uh, but I think we need to look at also India may be outperforming China politically, despite what is a kind of cacophony of political noise that comes from India. I think that in the economic sense, uh, the Chinese have done a remarkable job in loosening up the economy seeking to allow market forces to intrude. Uh, China has a long history with the market, uh, and obviously even in the long days of communism, uh, the market idea didn't totally disappear as it potentially has uh, for a large number of Russians. It's taken a while to come back. Uh, and so that, I think, uh, played a role in Chinese growth. Uh, Chinese was, China was, asked, uh, was able to mobilize um, in an uh, autocratic form, uh, large forces to generate uh, the change in growth. But one has to look at China as having gone through cataclysms that were not successful. Uh, the backyard blast furnaces, um, the Cultural Revolution, all helped to set back China. I India, on the other hand, has come out of a period in which I think that there was probably an over-devotion uh, to uh, what was essentially a heavily socialist-dominated set of ideas by the Congress Party, a situation in which an underpaid bureaucracy had an overly, put it this way, generous role in deciding things, and that was a natural formula to generate significant amounts of corruption. Uh, it was a situation as well in which there was not a real unleashing of market forces until about uh, the beginning of the 1990s under Manmohan Singh, who became foreign prime minister, I'm sorry, became finance minister and played a major role in beginning to open up India and move it more into the direction of kind of Western, more liberal economies. Um, but India had a long way to go in a sense that a very large share of the Indian population of 1.3 billion people is still among the rural poor. Uh, they are subsistence farmers. India is not subject to famines, but it is not subject, obviously, to rapid growth uh, in, the, uh, in the subsistence agricultural area. So these challenges are all there, um, and they have to do with things like form of government, ways of leadership, uh, and uh, the uh, impediments that in some ways uh, are inherent in the system in each country. India enjoyed in the Congress Party up until three or four years ago some rather large growth rates, but they were based on a very low base. Uh, but they showed every sign of being able to compete with China, but they're not sustainable. China is not showing a capacity to sustain forever very high growth rates as indeed the economic base increases. So both of them, them will continue, but they're so very different in their history and their tradition and their cultures that some of those uh, ideas and thoughts also play a role in why, in fact, uh, India is not right out there in front competing head-to-head -head with China.
in its economic growth and change. Over time, India has that potential, and one hopes that it will, uh, and there are signs in some areas that it can do so. One only has to look at the, Indi the Indian success uh, in information technology, where in fact it has been ahead of China for some significant period of time, and where in fact Indian IT industries have often established subsidiaries in China <laughs> to support them uh, in their work to stay ahead. And so it's not all uh, totally a one-sided uh, uh, race, and it's not totally um, uh, a um, uh, hare and a tortoise race, uh, but in many ways the Chinese have uh, continued to do better economic than the Indians do. China in the long term faces the question of what kind of political system will the Chinese find um, best uh, able to adapt uh, to their new and rapidly changing economic circumstances and how and in what way can that best be managed at the same time still take advantage of the fact that popular support and popular participation are increasingly the hallmarks of a successful economy. I think that India's greatest challenges include such questions as how can they deal with the ongoing problem of corruption in the economy? How can they, as Prime Minister Modi wants to do, mobilize very large amounts of capital, both domestic and foreign, for new infusions of growth? How can they take a still fairly antiquated national infrastructure and continue to modernize that, roads, railways? Uh, they've done a good job in aircraft. They've begun something good in the, in the roads. The railways are the mainstay of the Indian transportation system, but they're slow and antiquated. Uh, okay for the 19th century, not sure for the 20th, and certainly not up to the 20th, 21st. And so there are enormous opportunities there. India, interestingly enough, has an insurgency problem, which we tend to forget, um, both in eastern and central eastern India, the so-called Naxalite or Maoist movement, which has taken advantage of the fact that tribal people and disadvantaged people have been preyed upon, as they believe, in the economic system, often to promote reasonable developments, new mines, new sources of raw material, uh, taking their land, treating them badly, and they've joined the armed movement, uh, which has been built up around political opposition, uh, and but stretched across to banditry. Uh, and so growing numbers of districts of India have become, in fact, if not out of government control, only lightly controlled by the government. Um, and this is a, an organization that is part Robin Hood, <laughs> part the promotion of radical political ideas, uh, partly the promotion of people who, uh, for tribal and ethnic reasons, have been disadvantaged and gathered together in a kind of new local effort to try to sustain and support themselves. Uh, and uh, Indian governments at the center have tended to see this as merely the problem of the states of India or the local districts. Uh, and uh, some organized, I think, in considerable effort, mainly led by uh, economic ideas that promote better uh, social consciousness and more economic opportunities in those regions are likely to have a much more positive effect than more armed police or the use of the military. But both of those will have to play a role in it.